Loud and Quiet presents Midnight Chats. Good evening, listeners. Welcome to tropical February in London. It's weird and it worries me. And welcome to the first episode of a brand new series of Midnight Chats. Series seven, no less. Three years since we recorded the first of these conversations with a microphone we bought off eBay. We are still going, still going strong. Those tuning in for the first time, I'm not sure where you've been Maybe doing something more important, which is completely understandable, but this is what we do. Our podcasts are relaxed chats with musicians who we think have something interesting to say that loosely have a late night kind of vibe. And that's it. It's not overcomplicated. Um, Sometimes it's me, Greg, doing them, and sometimes it's Stuart. And when we're not doing this, we're making a magazine, and website, and videos, and it's called Loud and Quiet. It also has a website, which is loudandquiet.com. But with this new run of Midnight Chats, there will be a fresh episode every Thursday, dropping at midnight for the next 10 weeks or so. And I can promise you that this spring 2019 series features guests that are at least, at least as good as those that we've had on before. There's 63 of those previous episodes now, so do fill your boots if you have a particularly quiet weekend coming up. Anyway, I feel like this is a really good one to begin on. Most of the time when we're recording these podcasts, we're meeting the artist for the first time. You know, we have a brief talk about the weather, make them a cup of tea and then turn the mics on. But my guest on episode 64 is someone I've known for quite a while now, about 12 years, I think. And he is Yanis Philippakis, singer with Foles. I was lucky enough to be covered in cheap beer at and write about a number of the band's early shows. These days, over the course of releasing four brilliant albums they've very much outgrown playing illegal squat parties instead they now headline festivals 2019 is a new era for them since 2015's what went down original bass player walter left the band and they've self-produced a pair of new albums that they will release this year the first of which everything not saved will be lost part one is out on march the 8th now This chat is quite fresh, recorded just last week, Brit Awards week in fact, uh, in a slightly echoey photo studio in South London. In it we talk about drunk Russian tourists with fireworks, um, Yanis' recent visit to a Greek monastery, social media, uh, Stormzy's upcoming headline show at Glastonbury, and why his mum Yanis's mum changed the locks on the family home's bathroom door. What's left to say? Well, it's good to be back. If you like what you hear, please do rate and comment and subscribe wherever you're listening to this, all that stuff. Um, but here we go. The first in a new run of Midnight Chats. This is Yanis from Falls. Yanis, welcome to Midnight Chats. Good um, to be here. Thanks for coming on. How has your day been so far? It's been good. It's been quite long. Mm-hmm. Been chatting, did some photos, you know, all of the luxury problems that a man and a band faces. And this week is a busy week in the music industry. There was the Brit Awards this week. Did you go to that? No, I didn't. I've been in the rehearsal studio and basically... Yeah, we've been hammering it out for like six, seven hours a day and then come evening, go for like a pint and then it's back to... We just wiped after, so we didn't go to anything. Also, it's the Brits. Yeah, well, you went a couple of... You (laughs) were nominated and went a few years ago. What was the actual experience like? It was good. I just remember being, um, you know, it's like it's just pretty full on. Uh, But it was fun. I liked the spectacle of it. The food was slightly under par. 
Was it? What did they serve that I night? I can't remember, but it was something on crout. Right, okay. Was, it, was uh, it a bit like wedding food? Like when you go to... Yeah, like wedding food, but made without the love. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so, but anyway, it was fun. And then the party, the after party is always quite fun. They always get quite hedonistic and debauched. Um, and you always, like, meet Liam Gallagher at three in the morning and he's screaming at you wearing a white leather beret, which is good. <laughs> Sounds quite fun. It's a um, treat. 2019 is shaping up to be a big year for Foles, obviously. Where did the year start for you? Where did you actually see in 2019? I was in India. Okay. Yeah. How was I, that? On holiday, obviously. Uh, yeah, yeah, it was great. I went with my partner and um it was great we got fireworks shot almost directly at our head by a load of um highly inebriated russians who earlier in the evening had been wearing santa Chris, uh, father christmas hats and drinking to putin while watching his annual address to the russian populace it was fun it was on a beach i'd never been that close to a firework like i mean they were literally they were exploding at hair height so this was no, like, organised firework display, this was just people setting them off at random? It was just maniacs on a beach, full of vodka, setting stuff on fire. Uh, it was great. It, I, feel, I felt like it was a symbolic start to the year. Did you spend Christmas in India as well? No, I had Christmas in London, mm-hmm. and then I went to Oxford on Boxing Day, and then, yeah, went to India, and was there for a bit, and it was great. I've never been before, but I loved it. I'd like to go back. And, um, Where did you go? Uh, Goa, basically, it was mainly in Goa. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, the first bit of the, the holiday was, yeah, in Russian trance party land with relentless 160 BPM kick drums and fireworks coming at my head and dubious, dubious shrimps and prawns. I also saw a baby hammerhead shark on a fish platter and I was absolutely horrified. So I was walking out of, like, a hotel resort type thing and they had, like the catch of the day on ice, you know. And um, there was your usual snapper and mullet, you know, there was, there was your usual... <laughs> your classics. Yeah, your, yeah, there were your classics. There were your classics. Bearded bream. <laughs> uh, and then there was just tucked, nestled in amongst, the, you know, the more um, prevalent catch of the day was an actual baby hammerhead shark. And I've, I've never been more disappointed in... in in a fish, fish selection ever. Mm-hmm. I just thought it was just outrageous. On all of your travels over the years, what's the weirdest thing that you've tried in terms of... Food? Yeah. Usually I voyeuristically watch Edwin because he's kind of the most the first, intrepid... You're the first person in. Yeah, yeah, he has kind of no sense of self-preservation when it comes to food. I've watched him eat horse ice cream in Japan. It was frozen slices of horse meat and we ate it after a show so imagining that that's, that's then going to flow on a belly full of vodka Red Bull at the time, which is what the drink of choice was before the shows. Uh, horse ice cream. He also ate, on the same evening, he ate um, squid testes or squid eggs or something. But yeah, he was a glutton for punishment that night. It was the same night Jack passed out in the restaurant from jet lag and we, um, we fed him bits of squid and we drew little, we gave him a little French beard, <laughs> little, little Cyrano number little goatee and uh he's never forgiven us for that all right he still brings it up now yeah we have yeah it occasionally resurfaces on the internet (laughs) yeah but yeah i i'm a i'm i'm a pretty safe eater in terms of travels then since what went down uh you had a bit of time off and then you came back to recording and making a new record personal travel like going away for fun and not for work as you do all the time Mm. Where else have you been in between, well, the last couple of years, I mean, your adventures to India with some mad Russians, but where else is... I went to Cape Town a couple of times. I got some family there, so I went there. And that was cool. I mean, I always find it kind of an ambivalent experience going there. I, lo- I love it. I love the landscape. But the social injustices out there, like, I did never find, like, it's, it's not... I just always feel a bit... A bit I love it as a place, and I always have a great time, but you can't help but feel that things are not right there. Uh, and, and then the main place I spent time in was Greece. Mm-hmm. I went to Mount Athos, which is like a monastic community. Uh, it's like a peninsula in Greece, and it's been a monastic area for th- over a 1,000 years. There's 28 monasteries there. You have to like get a special ticket to go there. You can only go by boat. They have a customs border. It's like 
So it's got its own island. It's it's, 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 it's no, the, it's 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 on land, but you can they don't let you go through the land border. Mm-hmm. Only men are allowed, and it's only been men for like a thousand years. Right. And so it's pretty it? intense. There's like <laughs> it's a pretty intense place. Uh, what is the lifestyle like of the people that are? So it's just monks. It. It's only monks that live there permanently. They have some, and there's maybe a few people that live there to help the, the monasteries, or but it's only monks, proper monks. And what was it like it's when you very, got there? It's very austere. So I got on this boat from a place called Uranopolis, which is in, it's, a, it's kind of, um, it's north of Athens. It's like you go from Thessaloniki and you, you go along and you get this boat from Uranopolis and the first thing you notice is that on the boat it's only men, and which is it's very strange. And um, and monks, and then well, day tripping monks who were on their way back. Or they've been, you know, they might have been on a. Well, I don't know. They might have been to to criticize the Pope or something because they're Greek Orthodox. Most there's some Russian Orthodox as well. But uh, and then the boat does some stop. A lot of the monasteries are on near, on the sea and they have their own like jetties or their own like harb not harbors but they have their own you know docking stations. And I, we got off at, um, the one that I was staying at and. There were these, it was just something out of the Middle Ages. There were these monks in like these smocks who were going through their fishing nets and they had sea urchins. They'd been catching sea urchins and there was some fish. And then you're there and it's like, it's just full on. They have their own, their own clock, they have their own time system. It doesn't align with what we consider to be the, tw- the 24 hour clock. They're 13 days behind in the calendar. The food is Spartan. The place we were at, they were like, no phones, no drinking, no smoking. You can't talk in meal times. Uh, you're up at three in the morning to go to, like, services. The, the thing I enjoyed, I, I love the music. I love the spiritual singing. I, I was going to say, did you go there with a view to going on, like, a kind of mind retreat? Was that the idea? Yeah, yeah. And also, I was just, I, was in, I just felt curious about it as a place because it's just a kind of... In the same way, I, you know, I want to go to Mongolia. I want to go. I, I want to do trips that I feel like are yeah, interesting, yeah, basically. Like mind expanding. Kind yeah, of thing. just yeah. That's the kind of travel I enjoy. And um, Mount Athos is just somewhere where I was attracted to the ancientness of it and and the austerity of it. And the landscape's beautiful, you know. And it's like uh, most of these monasteries were like built like fortresses. They look like castles because of the piracy in the Mediterranean. But yeah, I, I went there partly to. I like after touring. I like to do to put myself in a situation that's going to freak me out. Like as in, is going to be the most direct contrast to, to to tour and to all of the excesses of the road is to go to a Spartan ancient monastic community and feel myself, you know, crawl. Like purging the tour experience. Clean, yeah. Cleanse the body. Yeah. And um, and then yeah, did you find it useful? Did you did you come back feeling refreshed? Yeah, I mean, I I came back feeling like different, you know, and and I enjoyed this this kind of like uh, changes your sense of self when you're there. You know, you think about who you are when you're in London. It's like you're attached to all of. There's all these attachments we have as people when we're in a kind of developed society in terms of fashion and our phones and like how we slot in, we think about ourselves in these ways. And when you go to something like that, like all of the coordinates are moved and you're just, just this person. Mm. You're just like a, you're just a human. And I enjoyed that. And yeah, and the music, the, like the singing, the, the Byzantine singing, I find that, um, I think it's cool. I'm into it. Did you snap out of those habitual things like that we all have, like checking your phone every 10 minutes? Yeah, I, I had to, yeah, because there just wasn't any signal. Right. I tried. Yeah. I tried to get online. Did you? Oh, <laughs> yeah, get yeah. on BBC just News? Just rapidly, rapidly trying to make it work, like a crack addict. Yeah. Did you just did it remind you that you've just like got a dependency on those kind of things like most of us Hugely. Have. I had that in India as well, actually. There wasn't really much Wi-Fi where I was. And, um, yeah, just quite quickly you realise, like, like, I read, you know, I, did, I started to read books instead, and I was, again, and, you know, I used to be a voracious reader, and one of the, my main disappointments in myself is that, I feel that I don't have the discipline or the attention span that I used to whilst in proximity to the internet. Mm. So I find the internet overridingly seductive and um, I don't feel I have the willpower to withstand it and that really bothers me actually. One of the things I enjoy about being forced to be without Wi-Fi is I, I, I remember how much I enjoyed 
living without it, you know. Mm. And um, and the time passes differently. Reading books and um, just enjoying that that feeling of just being a person that's out of reach is enjoyable. Did you see the Nils Farm stuff this week? Yeah, I did actually. I saw that yesterday. Yeah. What did you think of it? Well, so this bit, if people are listening to this and they don't know what that is, Nils Farm, obviously big celebrated musician known for his kind of largely sort of ambient music work said this week i'm going to start i'm going to come off social media starting with facebook so i don't like the idea that yeah which is the naffest one isn't it facebook yeah they get rid of the facebook first it's the naffest it's the easiest one to cull probably (laughs) which is the least naff (laughs) probably instagram i feel like instagram is the one that's a bit bit more edgy a bit more hip Yeah, yeah you're probably right and so he said he's going to come off of these one by one because he doesn't like the fact that that ultimately they've become the way that he speaks to his audience and he disagrees with their politics and the the morality around those services and so he's coming off and he wants to communicate with his his fans in a different way in a more direct way yeah what what's going to be interesting is how he tries to or how how he how he replaces it mm-hmm. i think about getting rid of um social media a lot and i i what i've done is get rid of it from my actual devices quite often as in you'll go through and you'll just delete the i'll just Facebook delete the app, app. Yeah, I'll just delete the app. And I'm close to le- deleting Facebook permanently. And then I have, I think this is what he, f- you feel ransomed. Like I have people that I communicate with through Facebook. And without it, I probably wouldn't communicate with them at all. And that's the, that's the little catch that keeps me ransomed in. Mm. And I guess Neil Fromm is reacting to that. And I, I, I applaud him for it. I wonder, I wonder how it's going to work out for him. But I think that, um, Social media, they, they sold us like a utopian technology and actually it's just a kind of conniving business as any other. They're just harvesters of our emotions. And um, having said that, I'm a total sucker for it. But I think that's the, the issue though, isn't it? Everybody feels pinched between these two things. Yeah, but, but that, isn't that in itself, they've made us feel like that, mm. you know? And I think that, um, so... I think good on Fram for kicking back on it and trying to liberate himself. We'll see. We'll see what he replaces it with, or, or how he will. You know, um, they just have such a monopoly on it mm. that it does just feel wrong. But at the same time, you feel kind of. But both just on a pragmatic level, that you'd be losing touch with people, and that would be bad for your your project or whatever it might be that you use it for. But also, but it is addictive. So you you feel the lack of it. You know, you feel the loss of the little serotonin kicks you get from from marty from warsaw you know liking a post yeah yeah or barry from bogner retweeting <laughs> with a comment yeah. yeah it's gonna be an interesting experiment i kind of think i watch it with interest in like a year's time to see if it, whether it has any effect or whether he feels better i mean ultimately that's that's probably what he's going to measure it by it's just if he doesn't feel like he's beholden to it and he's still yeah. Also Zuckerberg, it's like particularly with Facebook. I mean, all of, you know, all of them. But like, Facebook is so it's so clearly like morally. They just don't care, do they? They don't care. They don't pay taxes. Zuckerberg didn't turn up to the the, the MPs wanted him in for that select committee. He just doesn't give a shit. Yeah. And I just think that um, it's a hard company to like Facebook. They just seem they just seem like. They just seem like the, the devil's work, don't they, a little bit, in a way. <laughs> they do, though, don't they? Well, you know, they're, 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 and also all the Cambridge Analytica stuff, the fact that they don't, they don't seem to have a responsible attitude to how, how um, information and with political ramifications are spread. They just don't, they don't care. There's no social responsibility there. Mm. They, don't, they, they don't care. Do you think they care if loads of people decided they were going to... Yeah, if it hurt their going. bottom line, it would. But, I mean... It would require probably what, like hundreds of millions, if not, I mean, I don't know how many billion people. There's billions of people there's on more it. Than a, uh, there's certainly more than a billion people. Yeah, so it would it. require hundreds of millions of people to, to quit it or to be up in arms in some way. Yeah, they'd take notice if that many people did it, yeah. Mm-hmm. We should talk about some music. Sure. Um, so, we've got a new record coming out next week. It's the first of two albums you're releasing in 2019. It's 10 tracks. Ultimately, you've recorded 20 tracks. There's 10 tracks on each album. There's another one coming in the autumn. When you were working on all of this music, what made you eventually land on the idea of putting out two albums of 10 tracks as opposed to 
doing a double album, doing a but, massive long playlist style album. Why, why settle on what you've what you've decided to do? It just felt right, really. Like I don't, I'm not a massive fan of double albums. There's only probably only one or two that I can think of that I like. Even when I like them, I always feel that the good tracks are overshadowed just by the sheer volume of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like a Dickens novel. It's always a bit too long. Mm -hmm. It's like a bit of a tome. You pick it up and then you have to just put it down and you'll finish it another time. Yeah, and you just think, like, oh, cheers. You know, couldn't you have, like, given it to me in a, I don't know. Or like, it just feels like you're burdening the, the person. So we didn't want to do that. And, yeah, putting on one just, I don't know, just didn't feel right. We just want a sense of proportion to it. So, and, and also we felt that there were kind of two, that we felt that there were two bodies of work within the bigger body. Like I could see that there was two opening tracks, two closing tracks, two centerpieces, and that there was a distinctive palette. Mm. And there were songs that didn't go well together. There were songs that one of the concerns we had when we were at the final stages of recording was like, how will Black Bull go against Cafe, like how will they be on the same record? They're, they're such different such different entities that how are they gonna ever make something that's coherent? And we, we wanna make a coherent, structured record that's got a great journey from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And so the way of doing that was to separate out the tracks that didn't work together and that formed two better cohesive standard part records, but that also fundamentally exist in the same world. I don't feel that you've got to the end of the album until you get to the end of the, the, end of the second album. For me, the full, the real closer is the end of the second album. I feel that um, I'm Done With The World, which is the f end of the f part one, is like the cliffhanger. It's end of series one. Right, okay. And there's like dot, 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 to be continued. That's how I, f I, I, I think about it. It's called Everything Not Saved Will Be Lost. Part one and part two. So it, it, thematically, am I, is it fair to say that it's an album or it's a pair, or a pair of albums, one body of work, that explores the idea of... Nintendo. Nintendo. Yeah. <laughs> um, permanency or lack of permanency, the things that we might lose if we don't nourish or cherish or continue to develop. Is that, is that fair? And if, and if it is, what kind of things are you talking about in that respect? Yeah, I, I like the phrase. I didn't. I came across the phrase at a certain point and didn't didn't think about it as being an album title. And then it was one of those mind worms or something that kind of get in and you. It would just recur at times. I'd think about it and I was like that. It just stuck with me, and I liked the, I liked the fact that on the surface it's really banal, and it comes from this kind of cold, unsexy digital place of just reminding you. It's like a it's like a digital chore chore master. But then it's obviously got these, these massive romantic resonances underneath it, like you're talking about. And yeah, I just thought that it summed up a lot of the concerns on the record. And that as a slogan, I like big, big words in album titles. I like big titles, you know, like uh, I think that that's clear probably from the titles that we've chosen that we like big words. There's not a whole lot of nuance necessarily in the album titles. You know I mean, they're quite... You haven't fallen back on just calling it an album falls yet, which is fine, which some bands do by the time they reach album five. I don't like it. I've never liked that. I think well, if you're good at five. Yeah. <laughs> I think that the, you're only, you're, the only time to do a self-titled release is your first one. I take umbrage at bands that do it later on in their career because it's just smacks of, of laziness. Anyway, let's not get down that road. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, so, uh, yeah, just, yeah, I think it just sums up the themes in the, ly in the lyrics, you know. You talked a bit about how you had a vision in your head when you were writing some of these songs about the hollowed out centres of our towns and cities, the sort of decimated high street, vacant, replaced by automation and, you know, lack of people and communities. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask a bit about your memories of, you know, do, do you have a sort of nostalgic reminiscence when you think of, like, going to the centre of town when you were, like, younger and, I don't know going into our price or HMV and like those that feeling like a sort of center of your universe. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I you know, I always enjoyed going to town. Yeah, yeah. I was one of those kids who was like, I'm going to town, mum. Saturday morning. Yeah, Saturday morning. I'll get, be back tonight. Yeah, get on the bus, you know, sort of loiter with all the other oiks down outside the local HMV or whatever. And uh, you know, put get get a librette piercing, you know, drink some WKD that you get some 
some some, some man you hassle, yeah, outside of, outside bottoms up or whatever. <laughs> I was absolutely like that, and um, I made some great friends and some and some enemies through that type of physical architecture that used to exist, which was like record stores. Uh, in Oxford, definitely, it was like record stores. I used to love going to the bookshops in Oxford. There was great, great bookshops, uh, none of which really exist. There's only a couple. I mean, there's still some great bookshops in Oxford, but it was not like it used to be. Yeah, and I, I made friends through that, and I felt like I was attached to or as part of a bigger kind of cultural or subcultural group that was a f attached to these physical landmarks that exist. And to me, on tour, you know, if we're in a city... And I know I can go out and I can walk around. I don't care what the weather's like. If I can go and walk around and I can get a cup of coffee and there's some record stores and there's some bookshops. I enjoy that process of discovering a city, feeling like there's those types of um, sanctuaries in the city. Mm -hmm. To me, a city without that type of shop is, it's all just prep. Otherwise, isn't it? Basically, I was say, does a bit of your heart sink when you just walk past another phone shop or a, or yeah. a pound store or an Amazon locker unit? Yeah, or maybe you know, maybe for somebody else, a, a phone shop, phones for you. They get off on that, you know, and that's where they want to hang out and they want to talk to other people about the latest Android. But for me, I find that a thoroughly, um, thoroughly depressing proposition. So, yeah, I just was attracted to the, this idea of of putting these these scapes into the songs and definitely like the neighborhood I live in London it's there's lots of foxes I know there's foxes all over London but I feel like there's a particularly precocious brigade of foxes near where I live that have almost formed a union it feels like they're just out there in, in marauding teams but you can always hear them yeah oh, I mean in mating season it's like yeah and I just yeah I wanted to I wanted to represent them in the record I wanted to represent the the old decaying Victorian railway bridges and and the litter and the foxes and the weeds that are springing up and the weird foam they put in in shop windows when it's closing down mm. and um, but you know some Morley's chicken bones out clogging up the drain <laughs> and that that type of like particularly British detritus I just wanted to tap into that and then and transform it into something that's beautiful and that that forms the landscape for the songs in a way. Let's talk a bit about you getting out on the road again because I know you're excited to do that because it's been, in Foles terms, quite a while since you've been out. Since the last record, Walter's obviously left, bass player Walter, are on good terms and you're not going to replace with a new permanent member. But you have got Jeremy from Everything Everything coming out with you to as a touring bass player. Now that you've started rehearsals, how's he slotting in? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good. I was teasing him about his shoes yesterday, um, so I think that's a good signifier that he's, he's fitting in. Is he wearing Crocs? No, he likes um, these Clarks. Uh, he refers to them as dancehall shoes. They're like these Clarks desert boots. Okay, yeah. And to me, they look like tea towels that have got a cereal box taped to the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> but he likes them. He says he tells me that Vibes Cartel wrote a song about them, but you know, I'm yet I'm yet to hear it. Um, is he on day one when he came in with you? Um, did you give him like an initiation? Did you like after the day of rehearsal? I didn't give him the look on oh, the right, first okay. day. The look, the look. He didn't take him to the side before no. everyone started and say, "Look, this is he made like some mistake. He made some mistakes on the first day, and I spared him the look. But come come Tuesday, he got the look, and and the way that he dealt with the look was going to be symbolic of how he how he's going to continue for the rest of the year. Do you think he... How's he going to adapt to the Foles way of touring? I think he's going to relish not having to wear one of those tight tunics he's got to wear in all the time and everything, everything, probably. Yeah, or the boiler suits. That they sometimes yeah, have, sometimes I, I've been teasing him about that. I'd be like, telling him that he's got to still wear his everything, everything outfit. <laughs> the mechanics <laughs> outfit that he's got to wear. No, I think he's, you know, I think he's really excited. And they've been, you know, jokes aside, they've been great to... He's, be, he's been great to want to do it. I can't imagine wanting to go out on, on another tour after having already been on tour for ages. And certainly touring with us is, a, is tiring and fun, but, you know, but are we going to take it out of him, all right? Mm. I'd be surprised if there's much left of, of him for everything, everything to use afterwards. <laughs> We're going to wring him out like a sponge. <laughs> if you're just, like, handing back a just broken Jeremy to... Uh, yeah, to just, just a mop. 
why was it not right to replace Walter with a new permanent member of the band? I just couldn't, we couldn't, we couldn't even envisage who that would be. You know, the band to us is the five of us, and now with Walter gone, it's the four of us, and that's just what it is. It's just like, it's, you know, it's a family. It's like, you can't just sort of graft somebody onto it. Also now, you know, there was more room to manoeuvre in the recording. It was kind of liberating in, in us having that extra room, leg room. You know, Walter was a tall guy and he took up a lot of space. And now it's, <laughs> it's better. It's, bit too extra it's just bunks better now oxygen gone. now. Yeah, yeah. The bunk, there's more bunks in the bus. You know, each of us get a little bit more money and there's more space in the studio. There's better oxygen. On the tour in front, with the release of two albums this year, have you considered doing any shows where you're going to play both albums in their entirety say, with an interval in the middle? Yeah, maybe. I, we haven't really got to that stage yet, but I, I hope that towards the end of the touring cycle, once both albums are out, that we will do some sort of, some, perhaps something special, as it were, where we do the two albums, yeah, and then maybe with some old songs, you know, in the encore. Or, yeah, I think that would be cool. But we, ha we don't really have a plan for that. All, all, all we really know at the moment is... I think we're going to largely focus on album one for the first half of this year. And then, we, you know, we probably won't play any tracks off album two unless, until it's out. Oh, OK. Yeah, I think we're going to wait. Um, because partly in rehearsals, we just... There's so many old bangers we still want to play that without the show becoming two and a half, you know, we don't want it to get onto, like, Cure-esque lengths of three hours. Yeah, starting at seven o'clock in the evening. And I mean, I just don't know how he's got the energy for that. I just can't... I can't... We, you know... We want to play. We want to play great shows, and also just think out of respect for the music. It's better just to hear it on record first, most of the time, rather than on somebody's um, MP2 upload. I'm not going to pump you for information about what festivals you are or aren't doing, but I am interested to know look, big movie, music events happening later this year. Obviously, Stormzy's headlining Glastonbury for the first time. That's wicked. Yeah, I was going to ask, what do you think of that? I think it's wicked. I, I like Stormzy a lot. And I think that it's good. It's just good for British music in general. It's good for grime and like UK hip hop, but it's also just good for British music. It's just fresh, it's exciting. Mm. I'm interested to see like how the show will be and how, mm. you know, how he's gonna. It's a big crowd like to 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 command. I'm sure he'll do. He's gonna do a great job. But it's definitely like something where you go. You got it's a hundred and eight. You know how fifty thousand people in that crowd in the pyramid stage. So, um, but I think it's just, yeah, I think it's good. I think Glastonbury's bills are great. And I think it's important that a festival of that size can champion relatively, I know he's not really that new, but it's not like, he's not a heritage act, is he? So mm. I think that's good. It's like they're taking risks and they're creatively pushing boundaries in terms of their choices. And it's alongside, you know, alongside the more classic choices. But I think, I think that's cool. I've got a theory, or rather I've got an opinion that, Glastonbury should only ever book headliners once because I think like there's a special energy about getting that chance once and I don't think an artist has ever gone back to Glastonbury a second or a third time as a headliner and ever been better than the mm. first time. Um, That's interesting. Is there something to be said for what I'm interested to know is when you get to do things multiple times, like for example, once you've played a venue more than once, is there a special feeling you get from doing something for the first time? Like, would it be... I'm thinking, you know, you played a show at Wembley Arena, for example, a few years ago. Would you go back to Wembley Arena? Would it be the same if you turned up there for a second time? Or is there something kind of inescapably exciting about doing something for the first time? I think if the show is great, we've had shows... It doesn't, not even necessarily a big show, but we... Like, there's one... There's a couple of like smaller shows we played back in the day where we just had great shows there for whatever reason. There just there was a vibe, mm. and then we went back to those venues for a second time and totally it, it always it never exceeded the expectation. You know, it's very rare that you ever like because you, you build it up in your mind. So I think there's something there's something magical about doing something the first time, unless you didn't feel that it was you didn't have that really. You know, I don't mind playing the same place twice. It's just if you're trying to chase this magical magical event mm -hmm. that you can you can find that it's it's um crest falling or something but um yeah i think that lightning only strikes once right that's yeah. what they say they do say that yeah, yeah. The, the them yeah those people yeah them them lot
because we've known each other a long time, I'm just interested to get a few thoughts on just... Obviously, you're here talking about a new record that you're about to put out, but the very early days of Foles, we've talked about this before, but... You always want to take it back to Guildford or wherever it was, don't you? <laughs> Star and Garter. <laughs> Half in Marquee. Yeah, he's um, always just, it's like, it's sort, yeah, exactly. It's just imprinted there. You love it. What was um, that band that we played with? And they, they, they like, came with their sort of Sony publishing deal and their, their matching moccasins, and it was like, they had a huge, they, they, there was a lot of branding, and it was all preemptive, wasn't it? Because no one can remember them now. I don't know who the band was that night, but yeah, I remember they did bring. They, it, yeah. There was there was they had like the there backdrop was, and stuff. There was you and know it was a Thursday night in Hartford, and there was about twenty five people there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good times. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the question, really. Fond memories, like what 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 are the vivid memories for you of just those first like eighteen months of Foles before Antidotes came out? I mean, it was exciting. It was pretty wild. I remember being pretty cold a lot we were we had this red you know we had this we'd saved up for this postal van this red postal van and jimmy had managed to open the top of it like a tin can lid by going into a car park that was too low <laughs> and then the, we, we just froze our asses off in this thing and it had a brain as well it literally had this sort of exposed circuitry that we were using as an ashtray and we were listening to a lot of kitsune kitsune mixtape mix cds or whatever and Edwin's clothes were all in the back. I remember there was always, there was always, you'd go to get, get a piece of music equipment and it would always be, you'd always get a bit of Ed, an Edwin sock, a loose sock attached to an amp or attached to a plectrum. And um, yeah, that was kind of the vibe. There was a lot of excitement. There was a lot of anticipation. I felt that we were onto something exciting. We were kind of nervous. We were like anxious about the future in some ways. And we were, but, yeah, it was, it was a good time. It was a good time. It was also contrasted by like going out onto the road for these kind of long weekends and playing and, and then going back to our parents' houses in between. And there was something very, there was something like conflicting about going out and being like men of the road or boys of the road and living up and then going back kind of tail between the legs back to mum and then downplaying everything that had happened yeah. and asking for money as well. I'd be like, mum, can I borrow a tenner? I remember being broke, like we were super, you know, everything cost us money and we were making our own badges. Everything was quite DIY, I remember like putting a lot of time into all of that. It was good, it was a good time. But I definitely am glad I'm not still having to deal with Edwin's loose socks. And what would your mum say when you went back home and you were like, I just played a house show at 4am in, um, in Elephant and Castle? Would she be excited about that or would she be like, can you not make so much noise when you come in next time? Yeah, my mum actually, we used to have like metal, you know, we had the locks on the bathroom door were, were the, they were metal, you know, they were like a key type system. And my mum changed it to this tacky plastic one so it wouldn't wake her up. I think that was saying quite a lot. Yeah. My mum wasn't that particularly, she was quite stoic about the band. She was fairly, she was quite guarded about it. Unlike, say, Jimmy's folks who have always been like, they come to the shows and they like, they rock up with the Foles gear you know, the full shoes to the, you know, <laughs> full on, like, decked out in merch. And my mum... With, like, my a banner in the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, and my mum's only come to, like, a couple of shows. Not because she doesn't like it, but just... Do you think she just wants to give you the space to just do it? No, I don't think so, because she doesn't like to give me space in other aspects of my life, so I think it's more just that she she finds, um, I don't know, it's <laughs> too loud. Too loud. It's too yeah. loud. Fair enough. Yeah. Understandable. Midnight Chats is a loud and quiet podcast. Production by Emma Snook. Music courtesy of Gold Panda. Search Midnight Chats on iTunes for more episodes and to subscribe. For more information, visit loudandquiet.com. <laughs>